I had the idea for this Life After Langley series <clears throat> when um, our discussions with the senior staff, um, um, it, it came up during those discussions that they were thinking of going to a temporary workforce and people would work for five or six, seven years and, and then leave. And so I thought I'd ask uh, Steve to comment on um, uh, his experience uh, having left after that that time and uh, maybe uh, draw <laughs> some uh, comparison between um, his work at having have worked at Langley and uh, now having what five years now Steve or for something um, at the University of uh, Florida so um, please welcome uh, Steve Miller I'm looking forward to hear what he has to say Perfect. Thank you so much. And I appreciate the introduction, Dan. Uh, Dan was a great friend of me at NASA and still is. And I should also mention uh, Mr. Mike Marcolini is on the call and he was one of my first supervisors and it's his fault uh, um, if I did anything good at NASA and it's Dan's fault if I did anything bad. So that's a little joke to start. Um, Dan asked me to give this and it's, fro it's like a perspective of um, what it's like to leave NASA and become a professor at University of Florida, which is an R1 university. And R1 university is a classification of a university system in the United States that does at least over a billion dollars of research per year. So our research budget is well over a billion, and I'll, I'll mention that, because of course in academics, it's not just about students and teaching and all that and, and giving talks like this, it's also about getting grants. And that's, of course, one of the major differences between being a NASA employee and being a professor. So um, I'll try and talk for about 30 minutes so that way we get time for questions. There's some technical stuff in the presentation. I love technical presentations, but this is really a contrast presentation. And I'll talk about a little bit how my research, teaching, service, students, and all this has changed between the two. So I'm at University of Florida in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And we call our research groups some um, different things. Mine's called theoretical fluid dynamics and turbulence group. We're really an aeroacoustics group that tries to does turbulence a lot too. So let's look at the acknowledgements. I just really want to be thankful for my opportunities at NASA. It was almost seven years exactly. Uh, Mike Marcolini was on my interview. I love to hear his feedback after the presentation. And uh, of course, I worked with people like Dan and many other great friends who I still keep in tra track of. I'd like to thank the Alumni Association, of course, for letting me host this and all those who mentored me. And uh, some of you, I think, are on this call too. So an outline to talk, uh, I'm going to just talk quickly, who am I? How does someone come up and go to NASA? And, um, and then how do they maybe transition to a university or another job or stay at NASA? And I, I chose to transition to a university, which is a huge decision. I can talk a little bit about that. And I'll talk about my journey through the NASA system. And then they kind of came to a fork in the road, and I recall Alice's uh, Wonderland, Alice in Wonderland book by Charles Dodge and Lewis Carroll, and she came to a fork in the road, and she found the cat, Cheshire Cat, and she was asking for advice, and of course she didn't know where she wanted to go. But it's very good in life if you know where you want to go, and that was kind of played into my decisions of, of what I wanted to be doing with my time, which a big part of it was helping students, and you'll see that in this presentation. And then I'll talk about life and academics from examples in my uh, four and a half careers in academics so far. And I'll close with like a chart comparing uh, two columns, NASA versus, um, NASA versus the uh, university system. So let's do that. So there's me through, through the current university, University of Florida in mechanical and aerospace in 16. And of course I spent seven years at NASA before that and I graduated in 09 from Penn State with a PhD in aerospace and came up through Michigan State. And uh, actually in 19 I spent a, a basically a part of a year as one of the um, Air Force faculty fellows. And if you want to see a, a difference um, between NASA and academics is those types of positions are, to my knowledge, um, not open to NASA civil servants. And so those types of things, you know, you have different visitation programs in NASA, but this is something that you're expected and encouraged to do as an academic. So here's my personal journey. Um, I grew up in Michigan and I went to Eastern Michigan, undergrad at Michigan State Mechanical. In the lower right, you'll see a picture of um, 
a building in Russia that I studied statistics and culture and language. Then I went to Penn State, and then I ended up at NASA. Which, so that's the quick journey. And um, I love history, and I wanted to take a second to acknowledge the what I would call a beautiful history of Langley. And recently I've been helping our college and university create a grant writing workshop for NASA. And I had to create history slides. And of course, if you love history of NASA and you love NASA like I do, you've probably read Engineer in Charge, which is of course on NASA Technical Report Server publicly available. And of course, it's the history of the center. I'm sure you probably uh, would recognize a lot of the names, many more than I have in your time at NASA. Anyway, if you were there more recently, I think this was in 2013 or 14 or 15, because that was the 100th anniversary it came up in 17, 1917. And if you look closely, if you zoom in on your monitor, I can assure you I'm in the photo there in the top of the 100 in a black jacket. And surrounding me, I think, were many of the other people in the aeroacoustics and structural acoustics and those types of groups. And I would just mention, I firmly believe that anybody who worked at NASA, any part of it at any time, participated in what I believe to be one of the greatest organizations that ever existed. Um, I often say the Egyptians built the pyramids and the Americans put a man on the moon. And I think it's something as Americans we can be really proud of. And a lot of that happened, of course, at Langley. So when I was at Langley, of course, I was in research. And here's a few pictures. I was not an experimentalist. I probably went to the labs and caused them much dismay with annoying questions and slowing them down. You know the types, the CFD, computational theory people who come and bug the experimentalist. I was one of those and always goofing off. Sorry, Mark Marcolini, now you know how I was really spending my time. Um, and I learned a lot that way. That's wonderful. The great things about NASA for someone entering the workforce for the first time and able to get into NASA is there's so many opportunities in aerospace and across disciplines to really learn and grow in a safe environment, which is much, um, I think, more conducive for research than like an industry position starting out. But for my own research, you know, I mainly did jets and jet turbulence and related areas in aeroacoustics. So we were doing CFD and experiments and studying the turbulence and exhaust flow um, for application for noise reduction of mainly um, aircraft and aeronautics. And uh, we drew on kinds of experiments, and I got a little bit involved with the space sector through Space Launch System, upper left, that was an acoustics test, not at Langley. In the upper right, this is a um, test at NASA Glenn Research Center, and that was also interesting um, because they are using microphones and PIV and all the technology to understand the turbulence and the statistics and understand how noise is radiated from it, which remains one of the contemporary problems of fluid dynamics and a curious one which a lot of really smart fluid dynamicists and aeroacousticians worked on and didn't make much progress. In the upper right would be like a research product where we have experiments and different kinds of predictions from different kinds of turbulent phenomena to try and match experiment. We would then take those in our codes and try and um, you know guide people to design aircraft which were lower noise which benefits for the community and of course noise causes all kinds of other issues. But you can see in this kind of like domain um, at NASA, I think, you know, you can become a really specialist and you have the time to do that. In the academic world, it's very rare that you have such a time and you have to broaden out. So it's easy to kind of like get into NASA and really focus and look at these problems and make great strides. But it's very difficult to say, kind of take that and maybe move in to, you know, some other areas. And I was thinking about why do people spend their career at NASA, and when do people transition out? And so I looked at a few historical figures, and one of my favorite is Richard Whitcomb, who I never got to meet, but my neighbor in Hampton, Virginia, where I lived there, actually worked with him. And there's a wonderful video on YouTube of an interview with um, Dr. Whitcomb, it's pictured here uh, later in life as a retiree, and on the right, him working in the tunnel on actually area ruled aircraft. And you can watch this video too. If you can't find it online, you can email me or contact me, I'll send you the link. But he spent his life there. He was extremely dedicated, working seven days a week in the tunnels, hands-on experimentalists, and I think he gained international renown and respect for, of course, the area rule, winglets, supercritical area, which are used on all flight vehicles today and each one took him a decade, he would not have been able to do this work 
anywhere else. And in his video, and I remember it clearly, and I went up and I found it and I paraphrased it very closely. He said, I never understood why people left Langley and went to the universities and all the new things were happening here. So this is one interesting perspective. And as a side note, because people are concerned about research funding these days, one question after the talk said, there is now a process where they are trying to completely get rid of basic funding. And now anyone who wants to do something has to find a partner and find a source of money and get it funded through a proposal and start doing the research. And I put in blue to emphasize, like we are supposed to know the answer before you start doing research. And Whitcomb, uh, he replied, the more I hear, the more I wonder how you can do anything. And I think, you know, that's a feeling a lot of people uh, feel when they're starting out in Langley is understanding the finance system. How do I get funds to do my research? How do I do research? It's a, it's a maze to navigate and something to learn as people go. I would respond to that, well, welcome to the university grant writing system. Because when we try to get a grant to pay grad students to fund our lab to pay for everything we do, we have to have preliminary data. And so there has to be a way to generate that, but there's no funding mechanism. And so this is something people need to think about carefully when they leave a place like NASA where you're continually funded to do research generally compared to a university. Everything's relative. Then I looked at, hey, here's two people who left NASA or weren't in NASA in the first place. Uh, the first one, of course, is the center namesake, Samuel Langley, Samuel Pierpoint Langley, excuse me. And he was actually a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And of course, the center was named after him. And of course, he was famous in aeronautics. Perhaps my favorite researcher in NASA who left NASA to start a university, an aeronautics university, I believe in Brazil, was uh, Professor Theodore Theodorson, who is known and famous for, of course, Theodorson function elasticity and maybe some types of more ad hoc turbulence models. And you can read about all those on NTRS for free, which is a wonderful resource. And I just think anybody in this call today probably knows someone along your career at NASA, thinking back where you can think of someone who left maybe for industry or, or universities. And I know some other people. But it's a little bit more rare because it's really special to work at NASA. And why did they leave? What did they gain? And maybe what did they miss? Another thing to think about universities might be the Richard Feynman, a Nobel Prize winner in 1965. He wrote in one of his books, he wanted to be uh, Caltech and in the university system after working in government on the Manhattan Project because when he went across the campuses he would meet people from all kinds of different fields and that would inspire him to do good research and this is exactly what happens on the NASA Center when you walk across the cafeteria but it's very unlikely that you would probably run into people say in art history or English or women's studies or history um, you're, you're kind of in the aerospace world is there's the mission. So it's a little bit maybe more focused, but I think that's maybe a difference between universities and NASA, which I personally appreciate because I like that stuff. Let me talk a little bit about life at University of Florida now that maybe you have a perspective of different famous people and who stayed or left and some of your friends. Um, this is, of course, the entrance to the University of Florida, and I put my group name on front of there, taken in 16. And a lot of university structures are actually modeled after um, ivory towers and the ideas of religious studies in the medieval era. Um, I won't go into that today, but that's a slide from other talks. If you are ever in Florida, please come visit me and I'll show you around campus. So there's Orlando, there's Tampa, and Gainesville is about an hour and a half to two hour drive north of Orlando. And we're basically the primary university of the state of Florida public land grant. And there's some nice pictures just to give you an idea of what it looks like. This is a recent graduation on the bottom. I took that picture. But it's a beautiful campus and it's a great place to live. Another reason maybe people join universities is their location. Uh, last night I was picking oranges off my orange tree. And uh, you know up north they're battling snow. Um, as far as our department goes, uh, we're doing over a billion, easily over a billion dollars of research a year. And uh, when I left Langley, I think the center budget was approximately a billion dollars. 
So this is a multi-billion dollar organization and a huge part of that runs on research grants, which I'm coming to as one of the most important and biggest differences. I'll just give you an idea of what a typical large R1 aerospace department looks like today. We have 55 full-time professors plus 15 adjuncts and lecturers, 2,200 undergrads, and we're responsible for them. At NASA, NASA is not a university, so having that kind of student interaction probably isn't easily possible unless you get like an adjunct position, but adjunct professors are not professors at R1s, and there's a big difference. Uh, so I'm not addressing adjunct careers. 450 graduate students, 200 plus PhDs, um, and many student groups, and we're ranked 16 public aerospace, 17 mechanical in the last round, and six overall best public university in the United States. How does one leave an organization in government research and go to an organization like NASA that's not easy? Um, I personally wrote 125 applications. They're typically 50 to 60 pages now. When I was going, it was 30 to 50. And each one has to be customized for the university. So that's 124, well, 120 some major rejections. And that's not uncommon. Every position we hire for has 200, 250 applications. And everybody is just a star to make it to that point. I applied over five years, and uh, that's a very difficult thing. Every time you apply, it takes about a year to understand if you're able to join a university or not. And here's another difference between joining NASA and a university. Typically, NASA, when they interview people, in my experience, you're looking at anywhere from a half day to a full day. A university interview is two and a half days from 6 in the morning to 9 p.m. at night, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, meeting with finances, giving seminars, meeting with deans and administrators, staff, finance, teaching, lab space. It's a huge undertaking. When you look for positions, you really have to um, think about how am I going to pay for my research? And that's a very difficult thing. At NASA, I thought about research funding, how am I aligned with the projects, but I never thought like, am I going to be able to have to fire or let a student go because I can't pay them for their PhD. And this is really another common uh, unfortunate problem, but it's a big challenge. Um, basically, professorships, we serve the university in three ways, through teaching, research, and service. So when we apply, typically there's many applications, like 250 per position and 40 to 50 pages. And uh, it's even more competitive at, at high, highly ranked schools like MIT. And I put on the left, I won't go through it, but a typical application package. So this is before you even step foot on campus. Now good things come in three in life, and I wanted to mention three famous professors, which you know, Newton, Stokes, and Reynolds. Of course, Reynolds might be after the Reynolds number. Stokes was a mathematician, and Newton, of course, uh, revolutionized um, mechanics and calculus. And they all had the same three things they do, research, teaching, and service to the university and community. And I just want to mention a few of those quickly, because these are not things that we typically think about like in a NASA career. Of course you do research, but research in university is very different, as I'll show you in a second. But first I want to talk about time commitment. And if someone leaves NASA and says, I want to be a professor, they have to think about how much time they want to spend doing this job. And I put the breakdown, which we tell uh, kind of as a joke, and I put a Calvin Hobbes comment on the right to really illustrate it. Really you're working seven days a week. And if you're not working seven days a week when you're new in a professorship, then it's going to be really hard to get tenure at an R1 university. So I would say I would spend 70% of my time doing the research process, which I'll describe more, which isn't you know just sitting down and doing math and going in the wind tunnel. Spend about 30% of my time teaching and 20% of the time serving the university, running the university. And you can see that adds up to 120%. Faculty in many universities do not get time off. We don't accrue vacation days. That probably sounds a little bit different than a federal civil service job. And in our lives, in professorships, we're encouraged to think a certain way, that we should focus on three things, research, service, and teaching. And if you're not doing those, you're not serving the university, and I would probably say you're not really gonna get a tenure uh, after your tenureship. Everything we do in a university, in a professor's lab, 
and uh, research is paid for by the professor. But just like if you would start up a small company, you would get startup funds. So startup funds are basically all the money that you request from the university when you join a university to start your lab and pay yourself for the first two years. After that, you really have to focus and, and you're completely on your own. And you have to say, how am I gonna pay a PhD student who costs $75,000 a year for five years? And a year ago, I had nine funded students. So I was looking at a budget of about a million dollars a year uh, that last year before I graduated, so thankfully. But I just listed some things on the left here that people need to think about if they're in a academic position. And this is for all the academics you've worked with in your careers from NASA. And of course, academics and NASA have a very close bond uh, because, of course, we train the students who join NASA, and then we hope that someday maybe they give us a grant to do research to train future students. So it's symbiotic. But I put down here the last one, which isn't a joke. And I wrote, did you allocate money in your startup funds from the university to buy a trash can? And so when you walk in your office, a lot of offices are unfurnished. And one of the first things you do as a new professor is you go and buy furniture. Right? So at NASA, that's very different. Uh, everything's really provided, your computer, your desk, and everything. And that's good for research because you're not thinking about all that. But professors across the disciplines think about, you know, one of the first things they do is buy a trash can. And I have uh, funny stories about that after the talk if you're curious. Central to universities are students. They're central. Um, grants are important, but the students are more important. But of course, uh, if you don't have students, then you can't really do research because there's so much research to do that you need grad students, undergrad students at all levels to execute it. Now there's also the tenure track. At NASA, when you join NASA, if you're lucky, you can get a permanent position, but most a lot of people are in term positions. When I joined, I was on a six-year term position, meaning I had to get permanent status before six years, or I guess technically, I'd probably be on the way out. At the university system, you're on the tenure track if you are an assistant, associate, or full professor. And this means it's essentially a six job six-year job interview, and that's how people should think of it. Every day for the next six years after you get the job, you should treat it like a job interview. Because at the end of the six years, the faculty, the people you work with are gonna vote on you. And they can say, oh, you're gonna leave or are you gonna stay? And then it goes up to the whole university system and they evaluate everything you've done in your whole life in a document called your tenure packet. So think about that. Like, if you join NASA and you say my first six years, there would be like a vote by the senior people at NASA is if you could stay or if you had to leave. That's what the tenure system is. And so at the university, getting tenure is really hard to do. Not everybody makes it. And the higher ranked university you're at, the higher rejection rate there is. For example, MIT, I believe, has a one to three uh, re retention rate. And probably professors you worked at from um, NASA, some of them might have started a university like Caltech or MIT and transitioned to another university. Another thing is, um, what is research at a university? So this is, think about your research career or what you've done at NASA and look at this list. And I've kind of put them almost in order of priority. Writing proposals. Writing proposals is research and it's the most important thing a professor does in the university. Uh, monitoring the grants if we win them, um, writing the reports for them, advising graduate students is a privilege and we spend a lot of time on because they're doing the research and the most of the research. The hardest thing to do as a professor is hiring great grad students. If you make a bad hire and they're put on a grant which is worth 250 or half million dollars and they don't perform, then we have to go back to NASA or another federal agency and say, hey, um, I have nothing. And that's not acceptable to, to the project managers, even though sometimes research fails. But uh, it's very hard to convince some program managers who fund professors to give more funds if we don't um, perform. Of course, there's all the other things like writing journal articles and conference papers. If you don't write journal articles, you can't expect to stay in the university. So I talked about the research I did at um, NASA, and it was mainly in air acoustics. And now I want to talk about the research done I'm doing now in the last um, basically four and a half years. It was late 16 when I started and it's early 21. So um, most, first of all, when you win a research grant, over half goes to the university. They pay for everything. They pay for the landscaping, the electricity, the plumbing, et cetera. So when you win a half million dollar or a million dollar grant, 
divide it by two right away, and that's your cut. And that's a good cut in a universe. Uh, for every 10 proposals we write, we usually win one. And it might, some proposals take three months to write, some might take a few weeks. And so if you want to win one grand a year, you got to write about 10 to 12 proposals a year. So a huge amount of my time now is writing and finding grants to pay my students and do research. Um, this is very unlike NASA, where as a full-time researcher, I would spend 90, 95% of my time doing you know, something very focused. This forces me to think really outside the box to answer problems rel relevant to the federal government and society and companies, et cetera. So let's just look at some of these pictures I've taken over the last four and a half years. You can see in an earlier picture, there I am in the uh, one of our NSF boundary wind tunnels. I'll just kind of name programs. I'm now working in combustion and instability. That was Air Force work with another professor. I'm working on plasma and flow control for vortices. Um, running in wind tunnel experiments, which I've never done before. I work with another professor. We run a jet turbulence, an acoustics lab. That's like what I did at NASA. We do fundamental turbulence measurements in the NSF, that's National Science Foundation Boundary Layer Wind Tunnel. Um, we've done tornado work now. So now I'm studying the turbulence and atmosphere for tornadoes and acoustics from tornadoes. And we work with Texas Tech to do measurements of tornadoes. So this is the upper right picture is actually a picture of a tornado forming. And we have all the radar data, satellite data, microphone data and measurements to predict tornadoes for early warning systems. This is all funded by NOAA. Um, there's, um, these bottom pictures are actually um, boundary layer experiments. We're doing rotorcraft noise um, and aerodynamics on the left, and the US Navy has been really generous with me, and we're doing uh, all kinds of jet and engine research with them. On the left, we've done limited work with NASA on the um, jet impingement. That's rocket exhaust problem for uh, lunar debris and exhaust. On the right, we are working with people to minimize fuel noise and detection with um, government agencies. So that would be a non-public program. Uh, we currently are working with the NASA Sonic Boom team for the new uh, demonstrator to do sonic boom uh, propagation and understanding through the turbulent atmosphere. And we're doing a little bit of work with NASA Ames on their solid rocket program to do multi-phase CFD simulation to understand how the turbulence in the rocket plume changes with the uh, addition of particles. Um, we're doing and writing our own CFD codes, and they're a new method called spectral LES. I'm not sure if there's any alumni here who are in that business, but it's using supercomputers. We typically use 2,000 processors for 30 days on a UF supercomputer pictured on the right. So that's just an overview of the big programs and you can that I'm running in just four and a half years. And you'll see that to succeed in the business, you have to work with people across disciplines. For example, I was working with a woman in horticulture for plant aerodynamics and cooling for greenhouses. So the great thing about academics is you can do anything you want, but you do have to um, you know, win a grant and bring in money to support your lab. So teaching is something uh, which is the second most important thing in a professorship after research, if you're in a research institution. And there's me actually in 2016 teaching my first class when I was talking about the Navier-Stokes equations. Teaching is pretty straightforward. Um, and here's a, uh, I'm going to skip this class. This is just about what um, I've taught so far. And the third thing is service. And a lot of people, when they think of professors, they don't realize all the service we do. And we are required by our job, especially as a state institution of Florida, to work with the community, K-12 schools, governments, give presentations. And actually, this presentation counts as part of, my, part of my service. So you are actually helping me do my job. Thank you very much for that, and um, I appreciate it. And service means you are on committees and helping run the department aerospace and mechanical, the college, college of engineering, the University of Florida, in this case, the whole profession, like the, why do you see so many professors on committees on AIAA and IEEE? Because that's part of our job and we're expected to do that by our university. And of course, helping the community. Those are all really important things and it's a big perk of the job. Of course, at NASA, you can really do all these things too, which is good too, but it's not necessarily required. So we're near the end of the presentation. I want to take a few minutes here 
and really lay down and compare and contrast what I believe is like a research career at NASA versus a research career in academics. So at NASA, you can become a permanent civil servant and relative, this is relative to a university fairly easily. In academics, it's very hard to earn tenure. It's six years of your life and um, you have to do all these things and do them well. Uh, at NASA, I thought about funding some, but I wasn't terribly worried about it. You know, I became permanent, I think in two and a half years or something. And I, that was wonderful and I worked hard. I was in there a lot of weekends and federal holidays. I wanted to do research all the time. I love research. Academics is different. The thing I worry probably the most and what keeps me up at night is funding. Is if I hire a grad student, it takes five or six years for them to get a PhD. I have to find about seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars a year for five years continuously. You can't just have one grad student and be successful. You got to have a group and a lab to work together as a team. Labs at NASA are usually assigned and controlled. In my experience, at high levels, think of the big wind tunnels. In a university, your office and lab space is yours, and you have to find the funds to keep it running. It's completely the professor's responsibility. And that's a lot of pressure. You got to pay for electricity. You got to pay for water. Oh, something broke. You got to pay for that. You got to buy the garbage cans, the furniture, you name it. If it's in the lab, it's like a condo. You got to pay for it. Uh, so NASA generally pays for her own labs, which is wonderful. And a professor pays for their labs completely. The professor's responsible for the labs at university. At NASA, there's, there's not a lot of students. And uh, a few years ago, I looked at the NASA budget for education, it was like a half percent, one half percent of the total NASA budget, which is, I think, you know, in, in dollar amounts, I think it's been lower than it traditionally was. So that also pays for one of my students, the NASA educational budget through a fellowship. In the university, the students are central. They are the center of our world. They help do our research. We teach them. They're one of our products. They go out and join organizations like NASA, and they're, they're the future of our country. That is extremely important. Um, at NASA, I was reminded that NASA is not a university, and I should think very carefully about um, trying to create like a big student-run lab there. That's very rare. Some people can do that, but it's not expected. Academic freedom in university is central to one of our values, and it's protected by tenure, the community of professors, the law, and the faculty union, and there usually is one. At NASA, the idea of academic freedom is differently. Of course, you can publish great research, but it's reviewed at multiple levels, technically, which is good, but there's export control. So, of course, it's true that NASA can say, hey, I, I don't want to release this for some reason, and that's absolutely respected. That being said, of course, there's our ITAR and classified programs at universities that have the same rules. So you can do anything you want in the university as long as you uh, have time and can put it out there. And it helps to have funding for it. I already noted about job interviews. The job interview in a university is at least two and a half days um, plus six years for engineering. Medicine, it's eight to ten as an example for tenure. Uh, export control already mentioned. and. You know, in NASA, um, I did have my own office, and that was wonderful, um, but of course it's not guaranteed. And the kind of work I do, I like it to be quiet, and I can shut the door and have a room to write and think. Um, in the university system, it's guaranteed if you're a tenure or tenure track professor. Those are really the compare and contrast things. So you see, the column on the right, when you really look at that, there, there's some good things, but it's also really hard because you're expected to be here working seven days a week. My friends who are in the same position, I call them, what are you doing? Oh, it's Saturday night, I'm working on a grant. Sunday morning, what are you doing? You wanna go for a walk in the park? No, I'm working on a proposal. I'm helping my students in the lab. So you'll find people working at 2 a.m. in their lab um, well through their associate professorship, no problem. That's a big commitment. Why does anybody wanna work seven days a week where I think it's expected? Well, there's the reward, and this is near the end of the presentation. The reward, of course, to me is students doing new research and watching other people use it. So here's just a few slides of some of the students, some of my graduating PhD students already. Fun faculty, student parties on the left. It's Florida, so we can be outside almost all year. We have a Carolyn Baltar, some more students. Students. And that's where I'd like to end my presentation with, of course, the outcome of academics. Thank you very much for your time and love to have questions.